Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is a special mix about political sectarianism for Jurg's Radio. If you participate in social media, you've seen it. If you watch the news on TV or online, you've seen it. If you've been subscribed to political campaign email lists or texts, you've seen it. It's outrage porn. Messaging that's explicitly designed to produce outrage, to cause us to become outraged. In this case, outraged about our political opponents. This is true regardless of where you lie on the political spectrum or what party affiliations you may have. Whether Democrat or Republican, whether conservative, liberal or moderate, we're all being fed a steady diet of it. As technologist Tobias Rose Stockwell wrote in 2017, the world feels more dangerous, our streets seem less safe, the assault on our values is constant, the threats feel real. The enemy is out there, just check your feed. All these platforms vie for our attention, our vote, our money. One way or another, they profit from our fear and outrage. The huge political divide in America has been on the minds of scholars for decades. Since the 1970s, and especially since the 1990s, the gap between the median Democrat and the median Republican has been steadily widening. It's also been what scientists call the big sort where Americans have sorted themselves by politics, demographics, and otherwise. Political division is only one effect of outrage porn, but it's one of the most important, with many experts suggesting that our current level of political polarization is nothing short of a major threat to democracy. Quoting the introduction for a series of studies released by Princeton University in 2021, quote, much like an over-exploited ecosystem, the increasingly polarized political landscape in the United States and much of the world is experiencing a catastrophic loss of diversity that threatens the resilience not only of our democracy, but also of society. Brookings Institute wrote in January 2021, political polarization or the violence of faction, James Madison warned of in Federalist 10, is as great a threat to democracy today as it was in 1787, dividing voters and their representatives into diametrically opposed camps that are unwilling to compromise. Ordinary Americans are also concerned about polarization. A 538 Ipsos poll from June 2022 found that Americans rank political extremism or polarization as one of the most important issues facing the country, trailing only inflation or increasing costs and crime or gun violence. Democrats were the most likely to name polarization or extremism as a top worry at 33%, but independents at 28% and Republicans at 23% weren't that far behind. In 2020, a team of all-star researchers across six disciplines got together to look at the collective knowledge about our state of polarization. Their work resulted in a paper published in Science Magazine that hit the newsstands about the time of the big 2020 presidential election. They introduced a new term to describe it, political sectarianism, which goes beyond ideological division to something based on moral superiority and hatred. Peter Ditto is one of those all-star scientists. He received his PhD from Princeton University and is professor of psychological science at University of California, Irvine. Professor Ditto has worked to explain motivated reasoning and more recently, motivated moral reasoning, how people selectively recruit general moral principles to support desired moral conclusions. Here's Peter Ditto on political sectarianism. You know, we talked about terms like another term that gets used a lot is tribalism. You know, so sort of political tribalism at one point was the title and, and you can see that because it's this group based phenomenon. It feels like these tribes, right? One idea is I think our ideas are better or worse. You know, at worst, that gets you to you're stupid. Right, it's more like you're misguided, or maybe you're wrong in, in the noblest sense. But you know, it can get you to those guys are stupid. 
Uh, that's not the way politics works these days, right? It feels like it's about morality. It's not that the other side is stupid, it's that the other side is evil, they're bad. And it starts to feel a lot more like religion, like that the sort of one way to kind of capture that moralized feeling, right? It's about it's kind of like religious sex. And so we got to this idea of sectarianism, right? That, that it's like the, we have these two parties that both it's like this fight in the civil religion, right? Where they two each side feels like they have the, the the founders' goals in mind, and they really they really wanted this, they really wanted that, and uh, you know. And if you don't believe that, you're wrong. And if you start to talk about agreeing with the other side, well, you're an apostate. You know, it's not just that you're wrong or misguided. It's just like you're morally wrong. You're bad. You're, you're you should be sanctioned somehow. You know, so that, so liberals and conservatives, Democrats or Republicans, kind of feel more like Sunnis and Shias than they do like, you know, political parties. And that's kind of the feeling that you, that you get. And that's really the problem: is this kind of metastasized, uh, moralized political environment that we try to that we see very clearly in the data, and that we try and you see in your real life, right? And, Perhaps more importantly, it's, it's right out there, you know, how much the two sides really dislike each other and really feel like the other side is, is taking the country on, a, on the wrong moral path. A recent Fox News poll reported that only 18 percent of Democrats say that Republicans love America and truly want what's best for the country. Even fewer Republicans, 9 percent, think Democrats do. Now, I looked at the comments online for that polling. Here's one example comment. Quote, I agree that polarization will define the election as it defines the country because of Joe Biden and the radical left. I've never seen this country more divided, and I lived through the 60s. The divisiveness began when Obama became president and has gotten worse since Biden took over, end quote. Outrage porn plays a role in this. More outrage porn means more division. More division results in more outrage porn, and the cycle continues. A spiral of hate and anger, creating a powder keg situation. It's like this outrage spiral that you get into. And then that's what passes for communication, is trying to pay people back, feeling like, oh, you know, you're the evil one, you need to be paid back. I can do these things to you. And then it kind of... Uh, outrage stuff going on where everybody's just getting madder and madder at each other and taking more and more extreme views, you know, and just feeling like they're just being wronged and the other side is, is, is screwing them somehow. And here's another comment from that Fox News poll online. Quote, there is no reason for a sane person to vote for a Democrat. Quote. This is the type of statement we hear often from both sides about the other side. You perhaps have even made such a statement. And the thing is, we really believe it. And that's because we simply cannot see how anyone could look at the facts and not come to the same conclusion we did. When we try to change people's minds by hurling more facts, we just get frustrated. We cannot accept that they looked at the facts and used the same kinds of reasoning that we did, but came to a different conclusion. We really literally believe they must be insane. We cannot accept that they are no less sane than we are. And when moralization joins the mix, all bets are off. The outrage industry, or what some have called the merchants of outrage, or the outrage machine, feeds into these emotions, creating an environment for this motivated moral reasoning. So we have a you know, perverse incentive structure you know, where conflict is a great business model. It's great for the parties to raise money. It's great for cable news. Or even, nobody wants to turn on... MSNBC and watch a bunch of people getting along. That's just no fun, right? I want to see them fight. I want to see them, you know, and, and, you know, there's some perverse joy I think that people get when, you know, watching the other side do things that, that infuriate them in a sense, you know, it just kind of feeds this, you we're in this where those, these guys are bad. And every time you do something bad, I just want to see it and I want to revel in it. Peter Ditto is the guest on this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast because he, through his research, can help us understand more about the state of our political polarization and make sense of the outrage. My name is David Beckmeyer, and this is the Outrage Overload podcast. And now we'll hear all about that research.
Well, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I mean, so the, the thing to know about that paper, it was actually, it was a conference of sort of the, lots of scientists, uh, political scientists, psychologists, ec economists, communication people uh, that was going to be about, you know, political polarization. We had a pandemic. We couldn't meet. We decided, so what should we do? So let's kind of do a paper where we kind of put our heads together and try to summarize all the science that we know about this, you know, this kind of big social problem. And so, you know, it was this kind of group uh, project. And we, you know, we talked about terms like another term that gets used a lot is tribalism. You know, sort of political tribalism at one point was the title. And, and you can see that because it's this group based phenomenon. It feels like these tribes, you know, as we talked about it, one of the things that, again, that I've been particularly interested in is, is sort of the moralized nature of politics. And it feels like, you know, it's it's a, not about, uh, you know, there's kind of two ways that politics works in a, in a rough sense. You can think of the sort of classic way we think about it. You've got these two parties. They all have the same goal of trying to have effective government. Uh, one party's got one kind of idea, you know, liberal ideas, another got conservative ideas, you know. But you're the 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 noble opposition. You you know, you, I I know you're trying to get to the same place, but your ideas are bad, right? One idea is I think our ideas are better or worse. You know, at worst, that gets you to you're stupid, right? It's more like you're misguided or maybe you're wrong in in the noblest sense, but you know, it can get you to those guys are stupid. Uh, that's not the way politics works these days, right? It feels like it's about morality. It's not that the other side is stupid. It's that the other side is evil. They're bad. They have, it's not like we have different ideas about how to get to the same place. We have, we want to get to different places, right? We have these totally different sort of moral goals about that, you know, kind of what to achieve with government. And it starts to feel a lot more like religion, like that, that sort of one way to kind of capture that moralized feeling, right? It's about, it's kind of like religious sex. And so we got to this idea of sectarianism, right? That, that it's like the, we have these two parties that both, you know, it, it, you know it, it's sort of that are kind of vowing to, to, to get to the, it, it's like this fight in the civil religion, right? Where they two, each side feels like they have the, the, the founder's goals in mind and they really, they really wanted this, they really wanted that. And, uh, you know, and if you don't believe that you're wrong. And if you start to talk about agreeing with the other side, well, you're an apostate, you know, it's not just that you're wrong or misguided. It's just like, you're morally wrong. You're bad. You're, you're, you should be sanctioned somehow, you know, so, that, so liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans kind of feel more like Sunnis and Shias than they do like, you know, political parties. And that's kind of the feeling that you get. And that's really the problem is this kind of metastasized, uh, moralized political environment that we try to that we see very clearly in the data and that we try and you see in your real life right and perhaps more importantly it's, it's right out there you know how much the two sides really dislike each other and really feel like the other side is is taking the country on a on the wrong moral path and that's what we tried to capture in the paper and then kind of review a bunch of data that that were consistent with that yeah yeah so you know, and I, and I sort of on the podcast kind of make the assertion that um, this outrage-based messaging, what I'm calling outrage porn, I'm not the first one to use that term, um, is a contributing factor to this. Um, you know, it's sort of like we've been telling ourselves the other side is evil and, and, and we sort of now believe it. Um, is, is that a fair fair way to look at it? Yeah, it all feeds on itself, right? I mean, it's like this outrage spiral that you get into where it's not another another way I describe it a lot is it's like a toxic marriage, you know, and, and there's these two sides and they just have decided the other side has just done too much wrong there. You know, I really, you know, I really dislike this person. And you can see, you know, that it, you get this kind of, you know, this exaggeration phenomenon like if you've ever had a fight with with a you know with a spouse or a partner right you start to you know it's like you never take the kids no i always take the kids you you know and then you try and find the thing that really bothers them and you really stick it to them and then that's what passes for communication is trying to pay people back feeling like oh you know you're the evil one you need to be paid back i can do these things to you and then it yeah i mean i think it it, it you know the, the more we talk to each other more particularly in these kind of social media environments where there's a lot of anonymity and a lot of you know not you know it's easy to kind of throw bombs from the sidelines right you get a lot of that kind of 
uh, outrage stuff going on where everybody's just getting madder and madder at each other and taking more and more extreme views, you know, and just feeling like they're just being wronged and the other side is, is, is screwing them somehow. A lot of grievance. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a couple things I want to, I want to riff off of, of, of that, but one is, um, you know, this, this, um, I've been doing a lot of these interviews, a, a lot of interviews of sort of man on the street, I'm calling them where I'm just kind of talking to ordinary people and kind of get their sense. And you do get a lot of sense of this kind of, um, injury and that has now kind of turned into revenge kind of thing where both sides feel, especially I've noticed it more with folks on the right, but it's true for everybody, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and they've sort of gone into this revenge mode. Um, and I think that aligns with, with some of the research you found as well, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think that I'm really interested in this sort of pro- this process of grievance, right? Which is a really general sort of phenomenon when you feel like you've been wronged. And that's what you, you get. In, you get that in almost any end, right? I mean, marriage is a good example of that too, right? Where you're so... You, you feel like you're being wrong. Like, oh, I, you know, I'm taking care of the kids too much, or I'm doing too much of the housework, and you're not, not doing enough. You're not, and, and then it all becomes about paying that person back. You sort of lose track of taking care of the kids, and all you're trying to do is screw the person, you know, uh, that you're that you're mad at. And 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 I think both sides really feel that sense of of grievance. And clearly, there's no question that you know. Trump was sort of a grievance machine. He w- he was good at, at doing that kind of thing to try and look, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm always the victim. We're, all, we're the victim. They're trying to get you. They're trying to get you. You know, so, but but both sides clearly back and forth do this. And the, the problem with grievance, right, is again, it's just kind of a, it's a way of moralizing things. It's different. If, you're, if you don't get what you want, and it's fair, it's sort of disappointment. If you don't get what you want, and it's unfair, it's, it's grievance. I've been screwed. And then once you've been... Once you're aggrieved, it, it tends to sort of raise the threshold of what's morally acceptable, right? So if you, you know, I, I would, the best example I, I use of this, you know, a lot is if you would have asked Democrats, you know, 10 years ago, would it be okay to do some sort of underhanded uh, uh, legislative thing to take a Supreme Court justice from the Republicans? They probably would have said, no, that's not right. That's not moral. That isn't appropriate. But now they would say, absolutely, let's do this. You know, let's let's go because they feel like they, they that happened to them. They got one taken from them. So they feel like now a thing that they said before wasn't moral. Now is moral. You know, it's you know same thing. If, if I thought somebody legitimately stole an election from my side, I might have stormed the Capitol, too. I mean, if, if, if that's true, it's a perfectly sort of, re, or it's an understandable response, uh, you know, if if you've been morally, you know, injured like that. And, uh, you know, the problem was that there's no evidence that, that happened, right? The, the election seemed fair, but it, nonetheless, psychologically, you can see the sort of logic of it. It's like, if I feel like I've got my election taken from me, I can do anything. I'm sort of all bets are off. And that's what you get is this, everything gets more and more acceptable. The things that we wouldn't have done before now seem, well, fine, you're, you know, everything's, you know, all, all the bets are off because we've breached this moral uh, you know, barrier and, and, and it's time to, you know, just use anything you can to, to, for the good guys to win. Yeah. And I definitely want to kind of circle back to that a little bit. Um, but then I kind of want to go in two directions for a moment as well. You know, one is, um, it seems like a lot of folks are sort of have a doomsday perspective on this, that this polarization is a big threat to democracy, a lot of people talk about that Hamilton and Washington sort of talked about this being a big threat. And, you know, what, what's your take on that? Like, what's the real temperature? How how big of a problem is it and how dangerous is it? Yeah, you know, I get these kind of questions a lot. You know, haven't, haven't, the, two, haven't the two sides, the, the two parties in American government always fought? You know, didn't somebody call, you know, somebody's son a bastard or you know, whatever back in the, you know, the colonial times? That's clearly true that, you know, it's it's. It, we come and we, we kind of heat up and cool down historically a little bit uh, about this. Yeah, there's some things that feel, I mean, I'm not, a, predicting is, is really tough. It does, I'm not, I'm not optimistic though. I don't, you know, to me, it's, again, if you sort of take that grievance idea, it's like two, the other example I always use is, you know, it's two, like two kids fighting in the back of a station wagon. 
right? You know, they're all of a sudden you look back, they're beating on each other. You say, what's going on back there? Well, one says, well, you know, he hit me first. The other says, well, he hit me harder, right? So everybody's aggrieved. Everybody's got a rational reason for why they should keep going. And that doesn't just go away, right? Those kids don't stop hitting each other. Somebody's got to go back there, right? And, and stop them from doing this. And that's the situation we're in where we're just trading blows and it just gets more in this kind of outrage spiral. It gets more and more intense, right? And then, you know, there's other things that are, I think are really different, right? The, the media environment is one that's you know clear, right? It used to be that, you know, you could believe any crazy thing you thought during the day and then you turned on Walter Cronkite, you know, it's, at uh, six o'clock or whatever. And, you know, he told you what the facts were. He said, well, I guess I was wrong. That's now people just turn to, to, to their media sources, you know, uh, and people who look perfectly reasonable, who look like news people who are just telling you the truth and they just give you what you want to believe. And so that fuels everything. And that, you know, the, 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 the media environment is, is, is problematic. And the other thing I think is the you know, which isn't really psychological in particular, I guess, you know, it's the incentive. We have a, you know, perverse incentive structure, you know, where conflict is a great business model. It's great for the parties to raise money. It's great for cable news or anything. Nobody wants to turn on MSNBC and watch a bunch of people getting along. That's just no fun, right? I want to see them fight. I want to see them, you know, and, and, you know, there's some perverse, joy i think that people get when you know watching the other side do things that, that infuriate them in a sense you know it just kind of feeds this you we're in this where those, these guys are bad and every time you do something bad i just want to see it and i want to revel in it and you know it, it depends on whether the institutional structures can really hold you know and some of that's just luck i mean i think we got lucky the last time we had a couple of people in some in some key places Right. But I mean, I think that that, that stop the overlap. Again, even if one party sort of took over, let's I mean, I think that people worry about, right, it's sort of a Republican uh, autocratic sort of semi takeover. That's not going to be the end of the story. You're right. There's half the country who just adamantly disagrees with that. And they're just going to lash back out. Whoever wins the election. You know, we have this sense, I think, that we, if you just win that election, everything's going to be solved then we're going to be on top no that just pisses the other side off more and then they lash back and everything it, you know i think we're in for a big battle like this for a long time really corrosive uh you know uh, political rhetoric and and you know i think the things that change that are are, are luck events right i mean some cat catastrophe that, that sort of brought people together uh, you know, which is that's what a social psychologist would point to a lot. I think, you know, it's like there's a kind of a classic idea that if you have a superordinate goal, some, for example, some enemy that you can't beat unless you join forces together. That's what brings groups together. You know, that that clearly happened on 9-11. That was you know, where George Bush got you know, George W. Bush got higher uh, approval ratings than he ever had. There was a reduction in prejudice. There were all kinds of, for a while, we really pulled together. Now, it didn't hold, right? But, and I, and again, what I worry about is that I'm not, it's not clear to me that that kind of event would have that effect now. That if we had a major terrorist attack, that it wouldn't rip the country apart, you know, with mutual recriminations and things. So and I think we're in a very tenuous situation, but likely, it, and it's not one of these things that's going to resolve itself. It's just going to be, we're, we're in it. This is the fight. This is this is the ugly sort of toxic marriage we're in and we can't really get divorced. And so, you know, <laughs> buckle up. I mean, from my perspective, a lot of it is we've, we've seen the enemy and the enemy ourselves, too, because you mentioned earlier, kind of we're, we're sort of addicted to this porn and we like it. And there's all kind of, um, you know, behavioral science about that. And I know you you work in that area as well with a lot of the morality work that you do. But you find out that, you know, that there's a lot of, you know, we, we sort of like these black and white buckets, right, because it's much less cognitive load to drop do that quick analysis and drop a good thing in that bucket and a bad thing in that bucket. Whereas most issues are, are complicated and we don't really like that nuance. It's challenging and it makes our brain work. Yeah. Americans don't do nuance in particular. So. Yeah. You know, we talked earlier about that, that sort of this, uh, the extreme positions seem to dominate these landscapes, but 
you know, there's also in, 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 the, in, in this paper as well as in other research that um, there's sort of this distortion about that, that really we agree on more than we think we do, or at least we, we, we when we moralize the other side, we, we overestimate, you know, uh, how bad they are, I guess, is one way to look at it. Or we, or we overestimate how bad the other side looks at us, I guess, is maybe another way to look at yeah. it. Like they dehumanize us, but maybe not as much All those as we things. think they do. Yeah, every single one of those things you said is true. Every variation, like we think, <laughs> we have, you know, more believe more strongly in the the things we, that we don't want them to believe than they really do. We think that they hate us more than they really do. There's a whole you know that the the psychological sort of chasm is the is the big one. It really is the case that you know if you look, I mean, it's not like there aren't real different. I mean, I think it's sort of a a little bit of a you know. Uh, Pollyannish view to say, oh, you know, we really have more in common than we than we, uh, you know, disagree on. I, I, we do have a lot that we don't agree on. I mean, there's some real fundamental different kind of moral views, but yeah, but it, it, it it's true that we sort of agree on more things than we really think. We sort of overestimate how important all this stuff is to the other side and how much, you know, how how negative it is, and all of that's again driven. What yeah, what I've been interested in is kind of a lot about is how this moralization process then drives the, the, the distortion in the way we process information that we just sort of the more we hate the other side, you know, that anything negative we hear about them, we sort of take in and say, oh, that's true. And the good things about them or that, you know, the, and that's true at policy level everywhere, right? We sort of take in the stuff that sort of makes sense to us and makes us feel good and is positive to our side and we reject it when it's, you know, negative. And that creates this, I mean, another sort of aspect of this problem is this huge fact gap that we have, right? So that the, the, we have different factual beliefs about the world. I mean, global warming is sort of the classic iconic example. One side believes this is a real problem and it's really happening. Another side believes, well, it's not happening and it's a, just a hoax, right? And, but there's all kinds, you can just lay down all kinds of issues about, you know, uh, how police, police treat African Americans and you know all, all kinds of things, right? We just believe different things, and when and that just pisses people off too. That's another thing. In fact, you're trying to explain to somebody, well, no, you know, there really is global warming. You know, the, the temperatures going up, and they say, no, no, they don't. Temperatures haven't gone up. No, no, they've gone up. No, they haven't. Well, yes, they have. No, they haven't. It's like ah, you just want to when somebody won't admit something to you, you fundamentally believe is true. You just want to strangle them, and that contributes to the you know, the, the anger, and then the anger feeds the bias and the bias feeds the anger. And so you get this spiral of sort of distortion and, and dislike that, that really, uh, you know, kind of compound on each other. And, um, and again, I think a lot of it is a, dis it's a distortion. If you really get people together, they probably believe some of these things less firmly than they really think there, there's more commonality, uh, you know, there's more nuance that we're just not seeing and, and people, you know, when people say, well, I don't really believe in global warming. Well, it's probably more nuanced than that, less delusional than, than, than a liberal would imagine. Uh, you know, and again, conservatives you know, imagine, you know, liberals wanting to abort five-year-old babies and, you know, and, and they, you know, they, they will just believe things about the other side. And that's part, part of this process of yeah, moralization, demonization. Uh, you know, and it feels like this kind of, yeah, this kind of ugly religious sectarian conflict um, and, you know, with all the emotion and, and, you know, that comes with that. You know, it's kind of like the uh, disagreeing without becoming disagreeable. I think people are look, looking for that, you know, like you mentioned sort of Walter Cron uh, Cronkite back in the day of, you know, many listeners probably won't have any idea who that is, yeah, depending that's... on how much homework or history they've looked up. <laughs> But uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what that's one thing that's kind of missing is that voice that, you know, sort of, you know, is someone that you can trust enough that when they say maybe you're overreacting, you can go, maybe I'm overreacting. Whereas now, you know, our, the, often we're hearing that sort of from somebody we already kind of dislike and we don't agree with. and We have moral differences with, we think, you know, perceived moral differences. So when they tell us that, well, they're just wrong. <laughs> yeah, we just don't trust them. Right. I mean, it's like, I don't trust you. You're lying. You're not doing you have something else up your sleeve. I mean, that's the other. There's this huge sort of trust gap. Right. That's such a problem that they. People trust their own side and and not the other, and so they. You know, it's not like they don't get information. It's just that people just you know, they they brush it off 
you know. Yeah, and that's one reason why I'm a little bit skeptical of some of these tech, you know, being sort of a tech guy, a little bit skeptical of some of these technical solutions because I, I think that stuff can backfire, you know, to where, you know, like for some people, if it's fact-checked by Snopes, that confirms that it's not true. I mean, if it's, it's right. you know, shown false by Snopes to them, that means it must be true, right? Yes, and, and that's exactly right. Once this, once it kind of gets to this temperature and this kind of, again, moralization really changes. Once, once it's sort of a moral thing, then, you know, if I'm just trying to convince you that global warming is real, I can give you a bunch of facts and you go, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. Maybe it is. But I can give you all those facts. If you just say, I don't believe you, you're, you're just making that up. Then it's just like, I don't need to work to explain why carbon's, you know, going up or anything else. I just kind of say, no, I don't believe you. Right. And that's just so easy to do. Right. I mean, and so that no information, it's just like a Teflon for a, I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah. It's some kind of a wall yeah, sort of, of wall thing, a filter it bumps off of. And yeah, so it's tough to, you really, I mean, the, the one hope is this kind of what, what something I've studied for a little while is, you know, these Mavericks going to somebody from the other party, like a, uh, you know, evangelical uh, ministers who come out for global, you know, believing in global climate change and arguing for that, you know, somebody who's generally on your side, but is kind of taking a different position. And even those don't seem to be taking the way you, you would imagine. Right. Right. They get sort of accused of, you know, you must have been infiltrated by the yeah, deep state. You're right. Oh, you're, yeah, you're deluded. You, yeah, you're somehow, and yeah, it's, and some of that's again, you know, kind of conscious and, and, and we've got some bad actors involved and again i don't like to talk about that too much that's kind of the, the role of history i think that you know uh rather than psychology uh but uh you know there are some people involved in this that are kind of stoking the fires well and that was always something i've sort of wondered about is how well our system is really designed when there are a lot of bad actors because it seems like you know there's a lot that, that was kind of put in place to deal with it but it seems like bad actors can really take advantage of a lot of the aspects of our system that's kind of slow to react and on purpose, it's kind of slow to react. And so a bad actor can almost kind of game the system before it has time to correct itself. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I think that's exactly right. Right. I mean, the, we didn't, re, I don't think anybody quite realized that we're really not a nation of laws as much as we're a nation of norms. You know, there's like things that you just don't do. All right. And, and, uh, or, you know, they just want you to testify. You say, no, no, no. No, so you're ineffectively you're immune, and yeah, five ten years down the road, maybe the law will get back at you. Yeah, and it seems like the ethicists and sort of the faith and community leaders, you know, really focus on, you know, that somehow you, it becomes, you know, you have to somehow start seeing people as human and somehow you know, have those personal interactions, which is challenging, especially when we're literally divided up, you know, by zip code and things like that. So that if you just randomly go into a coffee shop, you're probably going to run into people, you know, with similar likes. So you're never going to have to um, have that conversation. Yeah, it's not just the media environment that's bifurcated. It's the way we live, this big sort that's happened where people just don't live near people anymore. And again, we're you know, things like, you know, and, and again, this sort of yeah, it, it reveals itself in these weird moralized beliefs, like this reluctance to marry outside of your party. <laughs> you know, it's yeah that people don't think it's worse to to marry somebody of the other party than they think it is to marry somebody of a different race or the same the same gender, right? I mean, all these things that we used to worry about now, it's like just don't come home with a Republican, <laughs> right? Yeah, and all these things also. I mean, the other part of this, just to add in really fast, is that the two sides of Everything sorted, not just ideologically, so that all the liberals are in the Democratic Party, all the conservatives are in the Republican Party, but they've everything sorted demographically, much so that all the liberals are people. I mean, again, these are exaggerations, but liberals are people of color, and and you know, conservatives are, are white, and so the all the racial and ethnic lines, everything goes together, and those are really ancient. These are ancient sort of prejudices we have against people who don't look like us, people who aren't in our group, and everything's working in concert now to sort of just say, here's this group that just seems completely different and foreign to me, uh, and you know that just makes it easier to hate, easier you know when all your prejudices are sort of lined up. 
I'm going to interject here because I wanted to dive a bit deeper into something I didn't catch until re-listening to this interview. And it struck me as a pretty important point, and that is this othering on the basis of race, people that look different than us, and how that has really ancient roots, as Professor Ditto notes. I asked Ditto about this in a follow-up email. He told me that it used to be the case that Democratic and Republican parties used to be more overlapping and similar in membership. Both parties had both liberal and conservative wings, a lot of ideological overlap, and pretty much everyone with any power in both parties was white. Religious people were also more evenly distributed. Now there is almost zero ideological overlap in the parties. Democrats are all liberals and Republicans are conservative. Almost all religious people are also Republican now. And more importantly to this point, pretty much all people of color are Democrats and the Republican Party is for the most part lily white. Same is really true with genders. Democrats are more women, Republicans are mostly men in power. The ancient part is that people are super groupy, tribal if you will. Small social groups are humans' evolutionary niche. We would never survive in the wild. We need others. And we are built to distinguish between us's and them's, in-group and out-group members, and are hardwired to be more favorable toward in-group than out-group members. We are naturally trepidatious towards people who don't look like us. That is the most ancient way of distinguishing us versus them, based on genetic relatedness as reflected in outward appearance, like skin color, etc. When people in the other party look just like us, white men mostly, it undercut our tendency to see them as an other, or at least it didn't facilitate it. But now all the group differences are aligned. Dems look differently from Republicans. Dems and Republicans differ in terms of race, religion, gender. These differences reinforce and engage these ancient prejudices. It is easier to hate someone who doesn't look like you than it is someone who is differentiated from you by some invisible group affiliation. And now back to the interview. Yeah, you know, and circling back to something else you said earlier about the sort of political landscape, you know, and, and um, you know, the extremists have sort of taken over these, these platforms and they've created the space where, or this environment where certainly, you know, moderate voices among the populace tend to just sort of self-silence a bit and pull back from these conversations because, you know, they're going to get sort of attacked by maybe someone on their own side. I mean, I've already had that experience with this podcast. Like I'm not attacking the right side right enough, you know, often enough or whatever, or powerfully enough. Um, but it also goes to our politicians as well. I mean, it's such a strange environment now that they're penalized practically for even saying they would go have a conversation with somebody on the other side and they would try to negotiate and compromise and it's become like a sin to do that. Like you were saying earlier, you, you sort of get ostracized and potentially kicked out of the tribe. Yeah, it's sacrilegious. I mean, again, this is all this sort of process of moralization with every, and everything's kind of wrapped up in itself, right? I mean, it's just, but you know, once it, once you're in this environment, right? If, if you're if you're too nice to the evil people, well then, well then you're sort of morally suspect. And so it, 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 it creates this sort of conformity pressure, this, you know, a, a, a allegiance. You just can't, it, it, the, you know, the, it's, it's the, the, the days of the maverick, you know, are, are, are a lot uh, uh, harder now. Right. I mean, you just can't say, well, yeah, I kind of agree with the Republicans on this and the Democrats on that. Cause it's like, okay, you're a rhino or you're uh, you know, you're not a true progressive and uh, yeah, so it sort of squashes the middle ground. It's all sort of part of the same pro the same dynamic. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think can be done to 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 give those more moderate voices, you know, a voice? I guess. Yeah, it's a really hard. It's a really hard problem. You know, again, I always when I go and give talks, uh, you know, and public talks to places. That's always I always say the shortest part of my talk is going to be about the hardest part of the problem, which is, you know, how to fix it. I'm really good at sort of telling you all the things that's wrong, but <laughs> there aren't. And I was just this morning, actually, I'm writing a chapter for something and I was looking at some papers that talk about uh, all the inter you know, possible interventions. And, you know, social scientists are really working hard at these things. And, uh, you know, and there's 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 things that sort of work on a small scale. But it just when I read them, my overwhelming impression is that this isn't going to work. This isn't you know, it's not scalable. You can't make everybody uh, do things. I mean, there are there there are, but it, you know, the the research gives some hints, like things like, um, you know, personal experience actually does. And when people talk about their personal experiences, 
um, it, that really helps. So when you get together and you talk to people and, you know, somebody says, well, I hate anybody that's, you know, anti-immigration or something, right? And then you find it goes, well, the reason I am is because, you know, my dad got his job taken and it really changed my life. And, you know, and I really came to this, you know, it's not that I have any personal about these people, but it just, it's really, right? You, you kind of go, oh, I see your, your, your opinions are based in kind of real experiences. And then people can understand that better. They, they, you know, so sharing kind of why you believe what you believe and do things, you know, really does help. Uh, uh, you know, another thing that, that, that helps is sort of affirming people's values. Uh, you know, so there's in, uh, it's called self-affirmation in, in, in the literature where, um, it, you know, even just allowing people to sort of express their values before they do something makes them sort of more open to counter information. Like, okay, I feel like I'm a good person. I, you know, I believe that. So I would try to do that with my neighbor, you know, a lot, you know, I'd sort of you know, just, just kind of affirm their values. You know, I'd say, well, you know, I had a conservative neighbor who, you know, I thought was pretty you know, reasonable guy otherwise. And I would say, well, you know, um, you know, I get why you have a gun. You know, I have three daughters, you know, I worry about their safety all the time. You know, I really, I understand, you know, you know, father, you know, you desire to protect his family and, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I get you. Uh, but, you know, now let's talk about how many guns you need, you know, how, how easy they should be to get, who should be able to get that, right? And then, and, and it kind of, and that that does work. It makes people more open if you kind of feel like, so, so this idea of sort of sharing things, there's, there, there's a, there's a sense in which if political discussions, like contact really helps if it's structured in a way and it goes well, but just throwing people together doesn't necessarily produce that, right? You throw people together, they very often they'll fight. And, but now what we have is a sort of what, what uh, old social scientists used to call austin, autistic hostility, where everybody's sort of separated from each other and you just hate, sort of hate from afar and there's never any chance to learn that you're wrong about people because you're, you're having very little contact. So, you know, so there are all those things are, are possible. There's, there's ways forward. It's just hard to figure out how to scale things up. Right. So that you get everybody in the country that's affirmed or everybody that's, you know, or, you know, or a substantial number of people that go through these kind of exercises. And uh, so, I, I, you know, and right now, yes, yeah, it's just the kids fighting in the back seat and figuring out, well, how do you just calm everybody, calm everybody down? There's also a lot of I mean, just a, a lot of strategies to sort of improve the processing of information. Like you know, things that so so uh, you know the internet uh, social media things actually is one way to scale things up really well right you can do change an algorithm and it changes affects a lot of people right away and uh, you know things like that can can really help um, but it's just some of those things uh, yeah, it, it, or you know tagging fake news right. And those things will help a little bit, but I always say they're sort of akin to, you know, trying to start a mediation during a bar fight. You know, it's just not going to take when everybody hates each other so much. And there's just so much vitriol. And I mean, I don't, you know, these uh, somehow we got to calm, we got to bring the temperature down, you know, to me, you know, uh, and that's a tough, that's a tough thing to do. Right, because it requires that sort of introspection and saying sort of I'm I'm part of the problem or I am the problem. <laughs> yeah, part, you know, part of me yeah, might be the problem. I, you know, it's part me, partly me doing this, right, when there's tendency is to just see it all on the other side. Yeah, I mean, our tendency is to, to, to look at that stuff that we sort of agree with and not not be too critical of it and sort of just pass it on and then be really critical of stuff we don't agree with. So, right. you know, that, that's – yeah, so, I mean – this is a little bit out of order because I always like to finish on an up note, but I do want to circle back to something you said earlier um, that, uh, you know, uh, we were sort of talking about the stories we tell. If we really believe the other side is evil, um, that we should not be surprised something like January 6th happened and we should sort of not be surprised maybe to see future violence. I mean, you know, what what can we say about that? Again, it's the kids in the back seat. Yeah, I, they're going to, it's going to flare up a Again, you can, I mean, again, imagine those kids, you know, so they're, you got them separated out. And you know, I used to do this with my brother, you know, your hand is sort of creep over a little bit. Yeah. You, know, you know, you're kind of, 
egging them on or you're pushing things or you do something, you know, you go to reach for your glass and you accidentally, you know, hit them and then it all starts up again. That's, you know, it's, it's the, the, the seething sort of dislike for each other. It, it, you know, is there under the surface, even when it's not. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it, I think our politicians are really failing us, I mean, and, and I'll say, you know, I try to stay very, uh, you know, down the middle on everything. And I think, you know, liberals that, and conservatives really behave very similarly. And I've, I've published work like that. You know, liberals are biased about lots of things, uh, conservatives uh, as well. Right. But I think there's a force on the right that's really problematic. I mean, there's people who, who are not stepping up people who are using, I mean, Trump was the, the classic example, sort of using, really weaponizing political sectarianism, kind of using this as a tool to, 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 to separate people and, and gain power by, you know, enhancing and stoking grievance, uh, and, you know, and things like that. And that's a, uh, it, and you, well, you've got bad actors who are willing to do this. I mean, it, it, uh, the thing I always add is, I, I think at the end is, you know, democracy is this incredible, wonderful human experiment, but it runs counter to almost all of our evolutionary tendencies, right? I mean, we're built to sort of separate people, the us's and them's. We're very groupy, you know, by nature, that was our evolutionary niche. And so, you know, it's easy to get people to separate and, and, and group up. It's much harder to get people to cooperate and behave nicely with people who don't look like you, who don't share your values in particular. I mean, you know, real democracy is just kind of reaching across and being able to tolerate uh, people who believe things that you just don't believe and somehow vow to work together. And that's not... That's really new. It's really hard. It's really hard to maintain. You have to work to, to, to keep that up. And then there's forces who can, it, it's so easy. It's such a downhill evolutionary putt to, you know, to, to try to uh, foment conflict. And, you know, people have realized that and they're, they're willing to use it. Um, so I, you know, again, I have a lot of faith in the institutions that we built. I think a lot of people really, I mean, one of the things that gives me hope, I guess, you know, I said, I think a lot of people want it to be less acrimonious. They don't like it. They don't like politics this way. Now, they don't they, they might contribute to it almost in the same sentence. Right. They say that. But I think I think that's very genuine that people want to try to get along. They, they want, uh, you know, to, this to kind of calm down and, and, and you know, be more cooperative. Uh, and that that's the hope that that side will that side will win out eventually. You know, I think there's, I think it's a bumpy road until we get there. But well, and that's literally kind of where the name of the podcast kind of comes from is that we sort of reach our peak, like outrage overload. We're done. Like we're going to have to start, we got to start lowering that temperature. And that's kind of what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm about with this podcast. Yeah. So awesome. So, you know, I, yeah, I think that's a good, good, good finishing note. It's been, uh, it's right. been great talking to you. Good. Give me a call whenever and good luck with everything. You know, I know it's a, it's tough business and, and all that, but uh, doing the Lord's work. So there you go. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you again. And great talking to you. Yeah, good talking to you. All right. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net, where you can also find past episodes. You can also find past episodes on Apple, Spotify, and all the major podcast apps and platforms. You can follow me, David Beckmeyer, on Twitter, at Mr. Blog. Follow the show on Twitter or Instagram, at Outrage Overload. We are also on Facebook, slash Outrage Overload, where there is also a Facebook group to talk about the show. If you would like to help the show, to help pay for transcription, hosting, and other costs to make the show better, there is a page for contributing on the website. If you really want to support the show, tell everyone you know about it. Share it on social media. Let them know. All right. See you in a few weeks.